Good evening and welcome to another C4 Atelier talk. Thank you for tuning in this evening for what I know will be a most entertaining discussion. And the topic of course tonight is the art of entering photo competitions. This is now the fifth webinar in our series. And if you haven't yet seen any of the others, please go back onto the website that you registered on. They are all there free to view. But the reason we are all here this evening is because we love the medium of photography. Both the, the tactile experience of being out in the field with a camera, and then the reviewing of images and the reviewing of these photographs back in the studio, where for many of us, the real magic happens. And for all of us here on the panel this evening, we put that process of making the photographs way above the process of entering competitions. So the question has to be asked then, why enter competitions? Why physically go and enter them? Because competitions can often be very contentious and they can be controversial forums. Now, there are reasons for them being contentious and that's based on those questions of why enter a photographic competition in the first place. There are many reasons. And two of the main points that you're gonna hear this evening are do not enter a competition to stroke your own ego because you will be bound to disappoint yourself. And the second is you enter competitions and many people enter competitions to test the images that you deem are great ones and see if they stand up to the scrutiny of impartial judges. So then comes the controversy, controversy because with any art form, there is a high degree of subjectivity that takes place. And there are many elements that are left to other people, namely the judges, to take control over. Or they have the control over. But there is solace because the three people that I'm speaking with tonight are able to break down and share with you via their vast experience the art of entering photo competitions. Because it is an art. And this is what we will be exploring tonight. You have that power and that control over your images and you can have that power and control over your images to give yourself the upper hand to, and making sure that when you enter and submit these co competitions, you have great insight, you will have the insight from the information that is coming this evening. Many people this evening that are listening may not have entered photo competitions before. So to set a baseline of what we will be speaking about, please know that the topic will be focused on entering photographs into wildlife and nature photo competitions. These competitions often come with a set of rules and with ethics. So tonight, those we will be discussing the rules and ethics set at the highest standard, because as award winning photographers, we want to represent the highest level of ethical responsibility to yourselves and any other photographers who want to enter into competitions in the future. As we move through the talk, please do send us questions via the chat box. We expect to speak for 60 minutes and then take questions for another 15 minutes or so. So without further ado from myself, I'd like to introduce you to Marcel van Oersten, Sophie Stafford and Neil Aldridge. You've read their bios on the, on the registration page and you should have seen the great and vast experience that they all have. Between Neil and Marcel, they won the overall images in the major international wildlife competitions on the planet. Sophie has the knowledge of the inner workings of major photo competitions, in addition to her first-hand knowledge of the judging panels of those top photo competitions. So I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves and give us a short introduction and background of who they are, where they've come from, and what brings them here this evening. Can we start please with Marcel, and then Sophie, and then Neil will end up with you. So Marcel, over to you. All right. Oh, I've been practicing this the entire day in front of the mirror, so this should go very smoothly. Um, <clears throat> I've, I was born in Rotterdam in the Netherlands, and then I started uh, studying Dutch literature and language in Utrecht um, for two years. I come from a very creative family, so that I suddenly realized that I should probably do something more creative, and I went to decide to go to art school. In art school, I had the option to choose photography, but at the time, I 
didn't like photography at all. So I just completely ignored it and chose uh, graphic design and art direction. Uh, I majored in those, uh, those two uh, courses. And that's when I started the career in advertising uh, as an art director. I did that for 15 years. Um, I worked very closely together with uh, tons of different photographers uh, for like from anything from lingerie to cars to dog food to insurance companies, etc. And that's actually how I got really introduced to photography and started to appreciate it more and learn about it more. That's also when I started um, shooting myself. And then I quickly realized that my photos were really bad. And that's when I thought I should actually try to learn to shoot better. And that's how it slowly developed. Um, I started as a, like a small hobby, then it got a more, into a more serious hobby. And then it got totally out of control hobby. Um, and by that time I had my own advertising agency and it was all very stressful. Photography became a way to escape from, uh, from the life in the fast lane. And that's when I started to idolize it and think about uh, whether I could make this my, uh, my new career. And that's actually how I got into photo competitions um, because I used those to see whether I was actually any good. And that's where I am now. Great, over to me then. So my name is Sophie Stafford and I'm a conservation communicator based in, in the UK. Um, going back a few years, I was the editor of BBC Wildlife magazine, which is quite a well-known international wildlife magazine for nearly 10 years. And during that time, I was actually the co-manager of the Wildlife Photographer of the Year competition in partnership with the Natural History Museum of London. So I was very lucky I got to judge that for nearly 10 years and, and also to co-manage it behind the scenes, which was fantastic. And I was also invited to join the juries of many, many photo competitions around the world from um, World Planeta in Mexico, to the Golden Turtles in Russia and GDP European Wildlife Photographer of the Year. I've still been judging since I left BBC Wildlife Photography. Uh, it hasn't finished. I'm still going on because every day in my daily life, I'm judging photographs from the magazines I produce for the conservation charities I work with. Um, I'm also regularly asked to consult on launching nature photography competitions. So now I know I have a roadmap to all the pitfalls uh, and the processes that you need to know. So I'm going to be sharing some tips with you later on about how you can give your sh shots the best chance of winning. Thanks, Sophie. And um, so my name's Neil Aldridge, and I'm a photographer uh, with a prime interest really in, in conservation. Uh, as well as photography, I also carry out filming. And I grew up in South Africa, actually, uh, even though photography had been in my family for four generations, it was it was that move to South Africa and actually having that wildlife on my doorstep that really allowed me to to kind of bring these two parts of my life together and I've never really looked back. And like I, I said, and like Shem mentioned at the start, uh, the, so the conservation and storytelling is, is certainly the, the priority for me. Um, so I'm fortunate to have had success in, in various competitions, but um, we'll go into how I, how I use uh, competitions as well to, to engage audiences in the stories that I try to tell about the, the, the species. That, that matter most to me. And um, as well as being a photographer, uh, I also lecture in Marine and Natural History Photography at Falmouth University here in the UK, down in Cornwall, uh, and work with about 300 uh, emerging uh, students uh, who hopefully are all looking to, uh, to be the next generation of, uh, of, of conservation and wildlife storytellers. Yeah, thank you very much, all three of you. Uh, as you can see, and uh, thank you for the reminders to myself of the, the very high level of and standard of speakers that we have this evening. So Marcel, as a photographer who has won many multiple awards, what is the process you go through in making an award winning image? Therein lies the crux, of course. How do you find that single image that you want to submit? And then what is it about the aesthetics of these images that appeals to you? 
I should, I should probably start by saying that I don't shoot for competitions. So the competitions are just something that I sometimes uh, enter into. But my main objective is not the competitions. It's just uh, I want to just shoot wh whatever pleases me. And um, I think that's actually very important because I care very much about my own artistic integrity. So um, that's the main objective. Um, when I when I sh shoot something and I'm at home and I go through my images, uh, a couple of things can happen. Uh, usually the majority I just uh, throw away. And then there's a couple that I keep. And then of those keepers, there's maybe like 1% that's like exceptional. And then I look at those and I, I might consider to enter them into competitions. Um, most of the time it's not really top of mind. So most of the time I actually completely forget to enter. Um, but when, when I do think about entering, then there's a couple of things uh, I think about. Um, the most important thing is to uh, try to put yourself in the position of a judge and to realize that uh, they see a ton of images and a lot of them will have the same sort of subjects. So the first thing I do is try to detach myself from my own image and then um, try to look at it like it was not my, my, my own work. And um, that's actually a very important thing to learn and to, to teach yourself to do that. And then um, I have to decide for myself whether it's actually original enough for any judge uh, to, to notice the image because there's, they see thousands, sometimes 10,000s uh, of images. So that's very important. And then it also dep uh, depends on what, uh, what competition I'm thinking about entering because all those competitions have different rules and they also have uh, a different kind of work that they, uh, that they appreciate. So if, for instance, if you look at the results of all the different competitions, you'll be able to see that there's actually quite a big difference uh, in the kind of style that gets awarded. So there will be certain images that I think are really um, um, have, a, have a lot of potential for a competition, but I may decide not to enter them because th that particular competition um, has a different style than, uh, than, than, than that image. Um, I usually plan all my photography a, a lot. So there's, there's basically three, three things that can happen when I shoot. Um, I always try to shoot as original as possible. Uh, first thing that can happen is that um, I plan something and I plan a shot and I already know that when it works, it will probably be uh, a potential prize winner. So that's one of the things that can happen. Um, a couple of years I won an award with uh, an image from, uh, from, from Deadfly in Namibia. And that was, that was a shot that I had planned a long time. And I knew that if, it, if, if, if I would succeed in, in shooting that, then it would, um, then I would probably be a contender. So that's one thing that can happen. The other thing that can happen is that um, I know that I'm gonna shoot something really original, but I'm not quite sure what the outcome is going to be. So then I basically just have to hope for the best. And when I get back home, then I look at the images and, and uh, see that it worked. Yeah, so I see the image now. This is the image I was talking about. This was shot at the time when all my colleagues said that uh, this location had been shot to death. Nothing would be possible anymore to shoot there. Anything original would be completely uh, uh, impossible. Uh, meanwhile, I had this image in my, in my head and um, uh, this, these kind of conditions don't happen very often. So I had to wait a couple of years to be able to shoot it. So, but this is a good example of uh, something that, uh, that was already in my head and I knew that if I was going to be able to shoot it, it would be really good. Then uh, the image that I shot this uh, for um, the, uh, with the monkeys that won me the title, that's different because I knew that uh, the subject was going to be very good and I had a plan on how to shoot them. But then because it's wildlife, you're ne never 100% sure what's gonna happen. Um, uh, this, is an, this is a different one, it's also a monkey. Um, so let me, let, me, let me use this one then. Um, yeah, you, use that one, yes. No, no the other one. 
Yep, that one. Yeah, so for this one, I already knew that uh, the subject was super original and that uh, people would be uh, fascinated to see this species because nobody uh, had ever like heard of them or seen them probably. So I knew that the subject matter would be really good, um, but with wildlife, you never know what's gonna happen. So it's very hard to know uh, in advance whether you're gonna create something uh, that's worthy of entering into a competition. And uh, so in, that's the second thing that can happen. Um, and so the, and the, third, uh, the, the, the third scenario, that's actually the other monkey. So that's when you don't have a particular I idea and just something gets presented to you. So something just happens and you just happen to be there and you just happen to know how to press a button. And then you, you photograph something that's like super unique. No one has ever seen it before. It's actually super funny. And with this image, I instantly knew that it was going, going to win something somewhere. Uh, but obviously this is not planned and, and it's just very, very lucky. So that's basically three scenarios that can happen. And then I decide which, uh, which competition to enter into. I'm very careful with what uh, image uh, uh, competitions I enter into. And um, maybe we'll get to that uh, a little bit later. Thanks, Marcel. Thank you so much for sharing this very particular insights because uh, there's all three unique images and also very select individual photographs. Uh, and I want to take that over to Neil specifically. Because Neil, uh, you've in more recent years been making stories by compiling series of images. So a very different approach to what Marcel has done. And so tell us your process of planning a photojournalistic story, if you like. Do you look at species only, or do you look also at the conservation angle that those species may, may trend towards? And then if so, what are those type of stories that attract you? Neil, you're on mute. How are you? There we go. Um, Shem, I should say as well that, you know, I, I do also still occasionally enter single images in, in competitions. Um, but just to clarify with, for example, the, the, the blessed book picture that won GDT European Wildlife Tour for the year, you know, that was actually shot while I was working on a story. So I was in South Africa working on a rhino story. And this is why I don't go out to try and shoot individual images, specifically not for competitions, because to be honest, while I'm around working on stories, I get these opportunities to to see other species and, and, and the more time you spend out and about, you know, the more you come across incredible moments. And, and that's exactly what happened here with, with these antelope. And after I took the shot, uh, we'd finished shooting the, the, the rhino story for the day, the light had gone and it was, it was an opportunity. And of course I still had to take it, but once I had taken the shot, I realized there was something special there. And I thought, like Marcel mentioned uh, early on, you know, there are certain competitions that actually uh, are, uh, they have a, a slightly different, um, often a slightly different look and feel and edit and, and the GDT European Wildlife Tour for the Year specifically is quite um, creative I find and I felt this would be quite a good fit. So I do still shoot single shots but mainly as, as you say um, I put most of my time and effort into developing stories and that might start through being commissioned by maybe a charity uh, to go and actually photograph maybe an, an event like a, a release of a species back into the wild. Or in the case of the, uh, the badger story that, that won the uh, British Wildlife Photography uh, Awards back probably about 2011-12, um, that, that was a vaccination trial uh, in response to the government's um, culling plans. And it's then once I've, I've been maybe commissioned for one day, two days, because these commissions don't tend to be very large, they're not months um, at a time, I'll then look at a story and decide, okay, is there an opportunity to develop this more? Uh, have, I just, have I just dipped into this momentarily and actually it, 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 I'll, I'll assess whether or not there's more to tell, there's, there's, I can go deeper, wider, and to engage people in the broader story. And often as well, um, I will just come across a story or I'll be aware of something that maybe hasn't been covered in a competition. So like with my Fox story, uh, there was a, a single image that was in Wildlife Photography of the Year, I think in about 2015, it was in the urban category. But 
that was actually part of a much wider story uh, that I'm still actually working on on foxes because foxes hadn't really been covered as a, as a broad uh, as a broad topic and that was one image that I, I, I looked at as a, as a concept I pre-planned it I decided that there were a lot of urban um, urban fox pictures out there but a lot of them tended to be quite close up uh, maybe remote camera shots where the camera is is quite close to the fox, maybe with some some bins that the that the foxes are uh, are raiding. But I wanted to tell the wider story and the bigger story and its relationship with its uh, with its urban environment. So that that picture tells a story, but it was also part of a wider conservation story as well. And um, just looking at, uh, at, at one part of your question, where you, where you asked about. Uh, the, the the opportunity to engage people in a broader story is it more than just the species? Um, so yes, there there are examples of of the badgers and the, the foxes which are at the heart of those stories. But I'm currently working on on a project on bats here in the UK, which uh, yeah, it's a great opportunity to engage people in a species that's largely unseen, largely under celebrated, but at the same time, bats are quite a uh, a significant um, sort of species that's, that is impacted by a whole range of activities and, and, and the impacts that we have on the environment around us through our food choices, through many choices that we make, uh, and through the intense uh, agricultural landscape that we live in. And it, the bat photos are only one part of that story. So at the moment, I'm working on, uh, on, on concepts to try and engage people with maybe some of the causes behind the decline in bats and why so many of those species that, that we get excited to see them because you get a fleeting view of a bat in the evening. It's always quite exciting, but these things are, are on the brink of disappearing. And uh, so I, I'm, I'm finding it, it's, it's, it's always exciting, but also very difficult to, uh, to, to identify those, uh, those parts of the story which may not be as attractive. There may not be big, exciting images. There might not be the, 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 the portraits or the, or the behavior shots. But the context is often, for me, uh, just as important uh, to say, look, you might care about this, this species, but did you know that actually all these things are, are currently contributing to their decline? And that, that's, that's what drives me on as a photographer. And making those choices editorially as I, as I develop my story, it gives me the, ch <coughs> excuse me, it gives me the chance to, to look at contests like World Press, Wildlife Photographer of the Year, uh, yeah that have story sections in them and to, to choose uh, to, to, to maybe put those into those competitions. But I will, similar to Marcel, I will identify certain con contests uh, and prioritize those contests first. So like I mentioned, Wildlife Talk of the Year, World Press, GDT, um, and, and then I will enter the pictures and those stories in those uh, competitions. And then after that, um, I might the next year enter lower competitions, maybe ones that aren't as important um, to me on my priority list. So, uh, so I don't just limit myself to a few, but I do certainly prioritize which contests I enter those stories into. Thank you, Neil. Yeah, fascinating. The, the varying approaches that you both have, yet the success that you have gone as, got as the result. And so, Sophie, taking that into account, what we've heard from Marcel and we've heard from Neil, and then your background of photo competitions, for somebody who wants to enter their photographs into a competition for the first time, uh, and not necessarily the first time, but it, let's just say into the larger competitions where they maybe have come from entering smaller local competitions, now they want to go international, what are those first steps that somebody has to take into account? Thanks, Jem. Yes, I thought I'd approach this topic from obviously a different angle to our esteemed photographers. Um, and I decided that understanding how the photo judging works and what goes on behind the scenes will really help you to improve your chances of success in international photo competitions. So I've prepared about 12 tips that I'm gonna share with you in several bunches tonight. So my first tip is uh, identify the way a competition is judged I think the others have touched on this already, but our Wildlife Photographer of the Year competition receives between 40,000 and 50,000 images every year. And this is increasing all the time. There are more and more competitions and more and more photographers entering them. 
So to decide which of your images stands the best chance of success, you need to identify how the competition judging works. For example, if you step back in time, you would have found that Wildlife Photographer of the Year competition, still the one to win for most people in our industry, was judged in three rounds. Round one was a check to remove the images that were obviously flawed or didn't fulfill the brief. Cows and clouds and children. Uh, round two and round three were by two juries of up to nine people, all of which were professional photographers, editors or other image professionals. And the judges would sit in a dark room at the Natural History Museum in London from daybreak until sunset, staring at a screen or when I started sometimes at transparencies on a light box. We would argue and get excited and have massive tantrums and storm out the room, but we would generally care very, very deeply about which images reached the final 100. We didn't always get it right, but we always gave 110%. Today, the Wildlife Talk for the Year has one jury, about six judges, including a chairperson, and they judge all three rounds of images themselves, first at home and then at the museum. That's a huge amount of work for a jury. Now, most photo competitions are judged remotely, either wholly or during the early stages, and the jury may never even see each other. So judges may be sent more than 15,000 images to review and score at home, usually using a point system. So often every category is judged by at least two judges and their scores are then combined and the images with the overall scores tend to be the winners. So on some competitions, the top scoring images may then be assigned their final positions in the competition by the head judge or chairperson who may look for a good balance of images, maybe to make a great exhibition or a book. But these two different selection processes result in really different images rising to the top. I'm going to come back to this later when I've talked you through a few more of the basics. So my second tip is make an impression. For World Press Photo, a jury of experts from around the world convenes in Amsterdam. Now so great is the number of images entered, even in just the nature categories, that each image is displayed on a huge screen for only about three seconds. Three seconds! Just imagine how hard your image has to work to make an impression in such a short time. Most of the judges' brains are still gonna be processing the three images they've just seen before when yours flashes up. So even when the judges are remote working remotely, it can still take day after day to get through 15,000 images. So of necessity, we judges have to work fast and images have to leap out or risk getting passed by. It's only in the later stages of judging a competition that there's more time to dwell on each image, to see if it grows on us or its impact has waned over the course of the judging. Now, some images will be hot favorites from the beginning, but they'll have lost their magic by the final day, while others that might not have leaped out at the start may linger in the judges' memories every night until they become an unstoppable contender for the final lineup. So of course, if you're a bit worried by now, it's important to remember that judges tend to be used to looking at hundreds and hundreds of images very quickly. So we, we have a trained eye for a good picture. It's not that hard to pick them out at a glance. Tip three, I think we've touched on this, is read the rules. Before you start choosing which images to enter in a competition, make sure you've read the rules and you know exactly what amount of processing is allowed. In recent years, competition rules have become both looser and tighter. New techniques such as photo stacking are now often allowed, while raw files are intently scrutinized for elements that may have been removed or changed in contravention of the rules. I remember sitting on a jury that was reading a technical report on uh, how Audan Rickardson had taken his award-winning photo of a trout in a stream under the Milky Way, and it was pages and pages long. It's really not worth getting a stunning image thrown out simply because you removed a tiny distraction that may not have been ideal, but certainly didn't ruin the image. So look to deal with it in a way that sticks within the rules. Okay, tip four now is read the category descriptions. In any competition, there are always categories that everyone enters. These are the hardest to achieve success in. For Wildlife Photographer of the Year, the bird and mammal portrait and behavior categories are always very popular and the standard is always really high. The now abandoned guard and wildlife category gave far more opportunities to shine and there's more room to surprise in the photojournalist singles at, in the categories today. So when considering where you enter your shots, 
read the descriptions carefully and don't always go for the easy or most obvious category as there may be more competition in there. In some competitions, images can be moved from one category, which is stuffed full of potential winners, to other equally suitable categories that perhaps have fewer obvious winners. Now, this is at the jury's discretion, and it's only for images that have a genuine chance of being winners. It doesn't happen in every competition, so it's best to choose your own categories really carefully. I'm going to hand you back to Shem, and I'll pick up on the rest of my tips in the next session. Thanks, Sophie. Thank you. That was very insightful, straight up. Neil, we mentioned at the start of how we love being in the field, and uh, but for many photographers, and I know just from a personal experience yourself too, we also love tinkering with our images in a digital studio, essentially Lightroom or Photoshop or any the, the post-processing programs that we have. So can I ask you, how do you go about processing your images specifically for competitions? in the overall sense of entering them, not just the editing themselves, but also just that overall sense when you're entering them and submitting them. Yeah, of course. Uh, so what I tend to, uh, tend, tend to have uh, is a, a pretty well-developed and re relatively basic workflow to start with, with all of my, my work. And that's largely a workflow that's influenced by Wildlife Talk of the Year, BBC Wildlife, most of my main uh, platforms and outlets for, for my work. Uh, so that allows me to, uh, to really understand when I put work forward, is it going to be accepted? Um, and, and it works within the rules that, that I know and that I understand. And it saves me also from multiple uh, processing nights where I'm staying up late processing something different for one competition, processing it again different for another as well. So, so when I talk about a workflow, I mean for all the way from how I shoot it, trying to get it right in camera, but then opening up it as a raw file, uh, running it through in, uh, in the Adobe uh, platform that, that, that you mentioned, but keeping things re relatively basic. Uh, and like I said, just being aware of, of what those rules might be, such as you know, removing, it might be dust spots, et cetera. But, but not not removing or adding um, elements, you know, beyond beyond the rules. Uh, so yeah, it's uh, it's something which it's important uh, to me to to stick to that workflow because actually because of the conservation messages that I'm trying to uh, that I'm trying to put across to my audience through my stories. Um, I believe that integrity is absolutely key. And when I say integrity, I mean, um, nowadays people are, uh, are, are well, as, as we know, there's, there's been a huge amount of questioning of things like climate change, for example, and a huge amount of money and time has been invested to try and discredit and disprove uh, various, uh, might be uh, messages or, uh, or campaigns to try and prove certain uh, sort of scientific findings in, in our environmental world. And if I'm trying to, to, uh, to raise awareness about a, a certain place or species or, or cause, um, I need people to trust not just my images, but the messages behind my images as well. So if I'm, I'm very much aware that if, I, uh, if I'm seen to be uh, adding elements into my images uh, to try and uh, create a certain emotional reaction in my audience um, by uh, well, it, it, it may it, by some people it could be seen as maybe um, un, unduly influencing or, or, or lying, and it's uh, it's just it's not an area that I, I'm prepared to get to get involved. And also, I'm, I'm not interested in my work being thrown out of a competition um, when when actually there's a huge benefit, of course, to uh, not just to me but to the causes that I'm that I'm working on and to the, maybe the charities and, and scientists that I've worked with on that story. Uh, there's a huge benefit to them in terms of the, 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 the vast audience that's, that these competitions can, can take my work to. So that's why I take it very seriously. Um, I, I tend not to, to actually enter competitions where my work will be up against maybe other uh, photographers who have been able to almost have free reign and do what they want uh, with, with their images. And it's, and it's, it's a very uh, horses for courses kind of um, Kind of approach really uh like i said if if there's no point putting one image up against uh someone else one of my images of an elephant or a rhino up against someone else's and they've completely created a 
uh, almost a sort of a fine art, very creative concept. Um, and I've uh, tried to be as faithful to, to the original uh, scene as possible. I, I find I often my, my image losing out um, to, due to the, the, you know, the beauty and the aesthetics um, in those, those situations. So I'll try to stick to the competitions that I know um, and th those that most match my workflow. Uh, it's also important for me as well to identify who the jury are and uh, just look at the, the individual members on a jury, just also so that I know that my work is being taken seriously and that my work will be understood as well. Because uh, if, for example, um, let's say I tell a story about some obscure species in, um, um, let's, you know, it could be a shark, for example, or, or a whale, and you've got no, no one with any either marine knowledge or knowledge of that species on, on the panel as well. It could be a concern to me that maybe, um, uh, that, that maybe my, my story, my images are, uh, won't be taken as um, maybe as, as, as seriously or seen as, as important maybe as uh, topics that they, they might, they might uh, be more aware of. Um, so fortunately, of course, in the last few years, I've had success with stories around rhinos and pangolins, and there's been a lot of press coverage, so it's almost impossible to, uh, to, for, for people in our industry to avoid those, those stories. Um, but of course, sometimes you're working on more niche stories, which it might be a fantastic story, but if, if it's not immediately clear, and especially as Sophie mentioned in that judging process, sometimes you've only got a short amount of time to get your message across. Uh, if it's not immediately clear that that species is, is, is really under threat and there's a, there's a reason why everyone should be taking this seriously, then of course your, your story might go by the wayside. And that's, that's of course where uh, the importance of just good solid photography comes in um, as well and not relying too much on the message and the emotional attachment as well saying but this is a really important story and look at this species it's you know, it's going extinct if you've not got good quality images then you know the the story is just not not going to stand up when it comes down to the final rounds of judging it might be a great story uh, in terms of the messages and the conservation value but if it's not shot well there's a good chance it just won't uh, you know stay, stay the course as it were when it gets to the latter parts of a competition so like I said, understanding who the jury is is really key for me, and I find it's quite frustrating at the moment in, in, uh, when, when many contests aren't actually announcing who the jury are um, until quite late on in the process, and by that stage, sometimes actually the, uh, the, the deadline is gone. So that's, that's a key consideration for me. I know that's quite maybe unique for me, but I hope that gives you a bit of an understanding there of my work pro workflow right through from, from taking an image to identifying how I'm going to process it, to how, where I'm going to enter it, um, and whether I think it's going to stand a good chance uh, in that contest in that year. And it could be that actually it may not stack up that year, but I will sometimes re-enter it uh, in, in, in maybe the following year. Maybe I'll have added new images to it. So if, it doesn't, if it's not successful the first time, I might actually re-enter it in the next year. But the same with the rhinos um, that I shot over about a seven year period. I had success in a number of competitions with my rhino story over several years and it involved entering uh, entering images adding to the story and and eventually ended up with a story that I was very pleased with and as a result it, it ended up getting the success and, the, and I think the, uh, the the seeing the audience that, that I wanted to, 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 to see that story so um, yeah never never stop developing a story if you think there's still more more shots to uh, to, to be to be made and uh, more more messages within that cause that you want to uh, that you want to shout about. So there we go. Thanks, Neil. Thank you so much. Uh, you made a number of very good points there, uh, but I think the one and I love the one that you connected not necessarily the ethics of entering a competition from an image perspective, but the actual creation and the integrity of that image from the creation point of view that is so important. Uh, because and then, and then how you enter that into competitions, I find fascinating because it's, you've got a career that you make that you're building and you're working on, and so the integrity of um, the competitions that you have and the images that you make and create is so important to you because it's your reputation in the end, and so you're working to keep your reputation as high as possible in that sense. So moving Marcel. Photo competitions have very rigid guidelines, and some of them more than others. 
how, how do you differentiate from editing images your own personal way versus editing them for a competition? Because that should have a very strong effect on the artist and yourself being an artist in some way. Yeah, so um, for me, because of my background in advertising and, uh, and graphic design, that has very much influenced me as a, as a photographer. So that's the way that I, that I work. So for instance, um, one of the things that I've learned in advertising is that nobody actually is, uh, nobody actually wants your, your advertising. So uh, you should try to, you should try to design something that's really simple and that immediately jumps out at you and that people can, uh, can understand like within like a third of a second or something. So um, I still do that. So I still try to keep my images like very clean, very simple. And um, that's also where you can see my background in graphic design. That's all, uh, all about very graphic lines. And um, I like things to be clean, including my house. So that's how I work. And uh, that means that um, when I'm in the field that I, I try to get my images to have a certain look that, I, that I'm after. Most of the time I will succeed to get that look in the field, but sometimes uh, that just doesn't uh, work 100%. So then when I get back home and I sit in front of the computer, then sometimes I have to use some additional tools to get the look that I want. Very often that involves uh, me removing tiny little distractions. So that can be like a, a little pebble or something that is like the only white pebble on the black beach that will annoy the hell out of me. So it has to go, or it can be like a little branch or, or, or one leaf or something. So uh, in those situations, I would, for my own work, I would remove those. But when you enter your work into a, comp into a competition, you should take real good care to read the, the rules because they're all very different and some of them are really strict and some of them not so much. So um, if I enter my work into a competition that's actually quite strict, um, then I sometimes uh, process my images twice. So I process one just for myself. So I, I use all the tools necessary to get the look that I want. And then I process it again, but then I try to get the exact same look, uh, but then using all the tools that are allowed by that particular competition. So for instance, I, uh, Shem, if you can put up that uh, the green monkey shot again. So uh, that, that image, for instance, um, there were a few distractions in the background. Um, if you look at the, the head of the, of the main monkey and then you just look to the right a little bit in the background, you see that main tree and almost at the top, there's a little brown out of focus smudge. And uh, that's actually another monkey. And um, if you're me, then you're like super annoyed that that monkey uh, was there. So um, for my, in my own version, I actually like, at first removed that monkey because it's tiny. Nobody can see what it is. It's, it's a brown smudge in a green environment. So it's distracting. So I took it out because for me, it doesn't change the, uh, the image one bit uh, in terms of the integrity. It's still the same story. But for me personally, as an artist, that was important to do. Um, but I knew that I was, not, I was not able to do that for that particular competition. So then I decided, okay, I can't clone it out because it's not allowed. So then I'm going to use different tools, in this case, dodging and burning uh, and uh, selectively desaturating areas to remove distractions. So that's what I did here. You, it, I just desaturated a little bit and uh, made it a little bit darker. And then probably nobody has ever noticed it only because I pointed out now, but so for, so to give you an example for me, it's actually still annoying that it's there. And uh, so I'd, I'd rather take it out, but now that it has won such an important award, I'll just, I'll just leave it in because apparently um, I'm too critical on, on the tiny little detail. <laughs> Uh, but but that's uh, but that's imp imp really important uh, decision you have to make as an artist. Um, uh, where do you draw the line? Because um, if I'm really honest, uh, I'd I'd rather not do anything different 
for a competition. I think that uh, if you're an artist, you should do the, the, the things the way you want them uh, to be and use your own tools and, uh, and not feel forced or pressured by competition rules to do things differently. Uh, clearly, my objective is completely different from Neil because Neil works in a, like uh, uh, most of the time in like a story related environment, uh, world press kind of stuff. Um, in those cases, truth is super important. So um, clearly, he can't change anything. For me, I'm not in the in the in the business of truth telling. I'm in the business of uh, artistic photography. So I've for me it should be perfectly fine to uh, remove a tiny little leaf or uh, remove a branch or in this case remove a completely out of focus blurred uh, fuzzy monkey far in the background um, so yeah so I, I i tend to process image twice if i think that it's absolutely necessary to do so. In the in the past, I've had images actually that won. I heard also in Wildlife Photography of the Year, I heard that I actually won the category, and then it was later disqualified because they saw that I removed a tiny distraction. So even if the rules say that removing tiny distractions is allowed, you should still be aware that um, judges are also their people, so they have their own. Uh, interpretations of those rules and they may be may be very different from your own so what is a small distraction for me may actually be a very crucial element for someone else so be very very careful uh, with that um, yeah. thank you Marcel thanks and thanks for showing us that uh, background blur in that photograph mm. because 98% of us have seen it mm. <laughs> Um, Sophie, we've been discussing making images in the field and then processing them. And you also then discussed how people should start entering the images. But how does a photographer enter images that are compelling and will make the judges sit up and take notice? Thanks, Jim. Well, I'm just going to be looking for blurry monkeys in, in shots from now on. But picking up my list of tips, we're at number five. So number five is study past win it, winners, but don't copy them. So one mistake that many people make is attempting to copy previous competition winners like Marcel's monkey. The year after a comp an image wins a contest, there's always a rash of lookalike images entered. But you're unlikely to make it through to the finals this way the impact of your images will be reduced and it will simply increase the chances of your hard work ending up on the seen it all before pile. So by all means, look at past winners for inspiration. Uh, most professional photographers delight in analyzing other people's pictures in competitions, magazines, on Instagram. So try flicking through a book of competition winners fairly quickly and see which images jump out at you and then analyze why and seek out images by big names in wildlife photography and ask yourself what made their work so special. Apply what you can see to your own work. It's worth knowing that the type of shot winning the Wildlife Photography of the Year competition has noticeably shifted over the past 13 years, with only two being traditional long lens shots and the majority now creating a more intimate effect or showing the subject's relationship with its environment, like Marcel's monkey. So tip six is to choose your subjects with care. 10% of the world's species make up 80% of all the entries in Wildlife Photography of the Year, and it's the same in other competitions. So popular subjects like lions, tigers, elephants, even Japanese macaques and polar bears demand extra effort to stand out. Anything too obvious will just have been done before and probably by hordes of others. So if you're going to photograph a popular subject, you really need to dig deep and find a fresh and alternative approach. When it comes to the crunch, no jury is gonna keep, keep six lion shots in a final lineup of just 100 photos. So at least three of them are gonna to have to be rejected no matter how brilliant they may be. Despite many people's worries, pictures of common and familiar species close to home stand just as much a chance of winning as images of exotic, rare and unfamiliar species. In fact, they may have a better chance simply because there's more opportunity to surprise the judges. So it's not what you photograph, it's the way you do it that counts. Tip seven is to edit your work ruthlessly. 
once you've read the rules, you've studied the categories, and you've carefully considered what subjects are going to give you the best chance of success, you need to start being honest with yourself and editing your images carefully. It's all too easy to become emotionally attached to certain images or to special moments that you remember really fondly. And this is when people tend to enter almost shots, resist this temptation. The sad fact is that nice, or mediocre shots won't win no matter how much your brand loves them. Be hard on yourself. Is the image pin sharp or is it slightly soft? Is the light subtle and beautiful or is it harsh and contrasty? Have you captured a perfect moment or did you just miss it? The trick is to make an initial selection of images, maybe two or three times as many as you're allowed to enter and then invite another professional to have a look comment and even help you make a final selection. They don't have the emotional attachment that makes it so hard for you to separate the fun and challenging shots from the really good ones. Your images need to be technically flawless, well exposed, perfectly sharp and pleasantly, uh, pleasantly put together. So before you enter, make sure you've looked at them with a critical eye and identified any flaws that the jury will spot at a glance. Next up is to be original. When you look at image, winning images in competitions, I have no doubt that you say, I could do better than that. There are no hard and fast rules to explain why one photograph wins a competition and another doesn't. But there is always one key ingredient, originality. The judges are looking for something that stops them in their tracks. Something fresh, whether revelatory, thought provoking, or simply exceptionally beautiful. Remember that we judges have to look at thousands upon thousands of photographs. So we're desperate for something really creative and surprising to leap out from the screen. Try using the formula RUM to help you choose your best shots. R, relevant. U, unique. M, memorable. The pictures that can fulfill all of these criteria are the ones that usually will win. Tip nine is don't give up. <laughs> Judging photography isn't a precise science. If the decisive factor was merely technical perfection, then it would be better judged by a computer. But it's also about art. So it's emotional and it's subjective. So if you enter your best image and it gets thrown out in the first round, don't lose heart. Enter it again the following year when another set of judges maybe feel differently about it. I remember an image called Flight of the Rays by Florian Schultz. It was a stunning aerial shot of a shoal of rays with just one breaching clear of the water. And the first year he entered it, it wasn't placed. The second year he entered it, it won its category. So it just goes to show. So give one of your images three years to make an impact. And if it's not been placed after that, then it's probably time to accept that it's not the best work the judges are seeing. But just don't give up too early. That's my second batch of tips and back to you, Shem. Thank you, Sophie. I think if you did some more uh, acronyms based on <laughs> Uh, tropical island drinks like rum, you, you would have people remembering the topics very, very well, should we say. <laughs> it's the first time I've ever heard it, but it makes very, very strong sense. Relevant, unique, and memorable. Thank you. <laughs> so Marcel, uh, we, we've seen and we've spoken about your uh, monkey, golden monkey photograph a number of times now, which is, was the overall winning photograph of the WPY World Wildlife Photographer of the Year Award 2018. But what happens once you've won a competition? Can you give us some insights into the conservation potential aspects, exposure, and just your personal measure as a photographer, what it did for you? Well, I have to start with the fact that when I was in London um, and they were announcing the, uh, the awards, um, I was not expecting it in the least, so I didn't prepare anything. I was, I was honestly, I was, I was uh, very curious to see <laughs> which photograph would win, uh, but I was not one of those in my head. So when that happened, I was just like completely confused. And um, those of you who saw the uh, award ceremony um, noticed it because I couldn't really uh, say anything. Um, anything useful and after that it was just very hectic it was like a roller coaster ride 
and um, I had to appear everywhere. There was lots of uh, there was lots of press, uh, lots of interviews and stuff. And uh, yeah, it's like a, like a storm basically. Uh, very interesting. Um, I got into contact with a lot of journalists, uh, a lot of interviews. So it was nice. Um, it was obviously also very good for um, for my um, for my CV and um, for uh, for my brand, basically. Also for our business, it was it was good. I mean, uh, there's, it's only has positive things you would think. Um, but it, what, what's interesting, and I realized that uh, during the uh, during the award ceremony, is that um, actually it can also have a, a negative effect. It's, it's not necessarily the case, but uh, in the in, in the case of my monkey shot, uh, something did actually uh, happen. It has to do with the fact that um, um, social media is so important now uh, in the world. Everybody is on social media. And um, basically everybody is trying to get as many likes and followers as possible by posting interesting photographs, interesting moments. And for the photographers that are online, uh, very often that means that they're all constantly looking for a subject matter that they, will, they would also like to photograph. So um, uh, Sophie, Sophie already mentioned, uh, do not copy shots that have already won uh, an award show. Uh, but it, it's it's still it, se it seems to be second nature. So a lot of people will still try to want to photograph the same thing, if it's not for a competition, then just to to see it. And th this this is very understandable. So it's not necessarily a bad thing. However, uh, when I photographed those monkeys for the first time, uh, there was basically uh, almost no tourism, and then after that, it got like really really busy. Uh, to the extent that they actually had to shut down the entire park because it was no longer sustainable. And um, this is not a unique thing that happens because it happens all the time. Uh, so you have to be aware that even if you, if you post something online, it can actually have a destructive uh, influence on, for instance, the ecosystem where you took that uh, photograph. So that's something to be, uh, to be aware of. Um, uh, to, uh, you can you can control that by uh, by not always sharing where exactly you shot something. So that's something that we already do with rhinos, for instance. Most people, most photographers, don't actually tell them where they took their rhino shots, uh, so that um, not to help the poachers. Uh, but that's just that's just a side note. Uh, other than that, I think it's re it's, it's really nice to win a competition. Obviously, it's good for your ego if you need that. Um, but I always advise uh, starting photographers um, when they ask me what should I do to uh, become a good photographer. I always say at the very start, just start by entering your photographs in competitions because it's the one way to figure out whether your work actually stands out from the rest. Because if you show your images to family and friends, those cannot be trusted. They will always say that you're really the best photographer they've ever seen, um, but you're not. So uh, just enter your work into competitions and then you'll, you'll very quickly find out if you, I mean, if you make it to the final round, that means that you're actually uh, way above average. So then you should already be very pleased. So even if you don't win, uh, be happy with making it to the next round and then hopefully the next competition that you win, maybe you make it to like the last round. Uh, those are all good things. And then afterwards, uh, check uh, and look at all the results and then compare the results to the images that you've entered because then you'll, uh, uh, be able to analyze and see why your shots didn't work. And that can actually, you can learn a lot from that. I, I did. So every time I analyzed the images and saw, okay, so yeah, so that's what people are after. So that's, that's a good way to, um, to use competitions to your advantage, even if you, if you don't win them. And other than that, uh, for, for me, it has been really good for, uh, just for my for my name, I, I mean, it means that a lot of people get suddenly introduced to your work. Uh, in my case, I was very good for our business because we run photographic tours. So then, a lot of people suddenly want to like join you on tours. 
So uh, that's, it's mostly 99% of it, uh, of the results, obviously it's very good. Unfortunately, the, you shouldn't enter the competitions for money because that's usually not so good. <laughs> not so good. There's maybe a handful where you can actually make, uh, make a few bucks, but most of the time it's just for the, for the honor and um, uh, for the experience. Yeah. Thanks, Marcel. And thank you for a very balanced view there of uh, what you know, many people would like to think that that becomes the glitz and glamour. Uh, but to give a balanced view probably tells people, which will definitely tell people that it's not uh, a celebrity status for the rest of your life at all. Uh, and that there are other relevance to, there is an other relevance to it. Uh, Neil, can competitions become a beacon for conservation? or at least create some sort of awareness. You know, are there editorial spin-offs, magazines that want to publish your stories? So when I talk about competitions, I'm talking about the images that they portray. Can they become these beacons of conservation? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, they, they, they can be. It is a bit of a double-edged sword sometimes as well. Um, you know, the, the temptation to, to photograph exciting subjects and exciting species can of course lead to to situations like what happened with uh, with the monkeys that Marcel mentioned we had a similar situation here in the UK just um, over the summer with um, uh, beavers that have just been allowed to stay back in uh, back in England and some good friends of mine have been uh, photographing and filming them and anyway one one other uh, amateur photographer then uh, decided, having got a few shots, that they'd share the stories, uh, the, the, the pictures through the local press, and not um, and, uh, and not really be too uh, careful with the, with the location. And within literally days, there were hundreds of photographers lined up along the um, along the riverbank within a few meters of this um, uh, of, of where these beavers um, were, were living and swimming. And what you quickly found was that the um, uh, the beavers then decided to move on and move in, uh, to, to to another part of the river, and, uh, and 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 that was just through through not not really um, I, I would say sort of putting the subjects first, which I think is al always important. Um, but they can, of course, uh, through competitions, you can uh, you can reach a huge number of uh, of people. The audience, I, I find, is significantly more than most publications, uh, which publications might be reaching maybe a few tens of thousands of, of readers but just looking at world press for example with uh, with my my rhino image you know that was uh, that reached millions of people worldwide they the the the, the competition uh, team that that uh, that worked so hard off the back end of that um, uh, that, that competition they they not just uh, uh, promotes the the images through exhibitions, the traveling exhibition that goes to uh, so many cities worldwide. But of course, there's all of the associated uh, press launches. There's the books. Uh, so there's a huge amount uh, of of, uh, um, of opportunity to uh, opportunities to for, for people to see whether it's the single images or whether it's the stories that 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 are being told. So. Um, you know the, uh, the 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 competitions that I mentioned earlier on, World Press, Wildlife Photographer of the Year, um, and and a few of the others. They they for me are are actually significant outlets for my stories. They're they're really important, um, uh, and and I do I do look at the uh, at the opportunities that they that they present uh, uh, very seriously, and I, and I, I work them into the timescales. Of, of my my shooting and my storytelling sometimes of course you might have might have an opportunity to uh, to, to, to do a shoot that might just fall maybe just after a deadline and it's one of those things you might have to sit on those images for for another year uh, and that was the case with my rhino story but but talking about the um, the, the positive influence and, and I guess the opportunity um, that, uh, that 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 you have through these uh, through these competitions, I guess. So one one of the best examples probably is that rhino story um, that I worked on in uh, in Botswana and South Africa, but particularly that one image that you just showed just there, Shem, of the um, uh, of the white rhino with the red blindfold over its face. 
you know, that's, that was announced as a winner in, uh, in World Press, but it also featured in several other competitions, and I can't quite recall all of them now. It's one of those situations where that, I've kind of lost control of that image, um, which is fine. It's in a nice, nice position in, in a way to, uh, to be in where that's being shared and it's being recognized as, 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 a, uh, as a really positive um, uh, story in, in the world of rhinos. And I, and I think actually we got to a stage uh, probably up until about 2017, the year, so the year before Marcel won Wildlife Photographer of the Year, um, it was won by Brent Sturton with uh, an image of a rhino that had been poached in South Africa. And I think um, we almost got to, got to a stage around that time when people, in conversations I was having, people were getting very, um, I guess, uh, just overly uh, saturated with with negative stories with with pictures of poaching and uh, and and blood and guts and gore and all of these um, uh, th these messages of of pain and uh, and struggle and i had a very uh, unique opportunity and i recognized the opportunity early on i had a unique opportunity through my work in botswana to to tell a positive story and that that image there uh, when it was announced as a winner in World Press, people really latched onto it and messaged me actually on Instagram while they were stood in the exhibition looking at the picture saying, wow, I thought at first this was going to be another negative picture, but I'm so moved by, by the great news that actually there's a good news story in the world of rhinos for once. And, you know, for me to have been part of that movement, you know, I, I, yes, I was there on the day and I was actually doing a lot of other uh, sort of scientific photography for the team uh, in Rhino Conservation Botswana team that, that was uh, doing that work. Um, but my my role there was purely, I guess, to be that kind of that window for the audience to, 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 to see what those that great team of conservationists and vets and researchers were all doing. So um, that's how I see my my role and that's how I see competitions that it's, it's, it really is a, an important platform um, to, to, I guess, sort of open that window on, on the world of conservation and let people in to see, um, to see the great work that's going on. And there are some people working long hours um, that, that I get to work with who are, who are out there day in, day out, facing the realities of, um, of uh, the struggles that these, these species uh, have and these habitats have. And, uh, and I see it as my, my duty to tell their story as well as the story of, uh, of the animals I work with. Yeah, I love the fact that your rhino photograph became a positive story. It became a positive story, yeah. Thanks, Neil. And we're running sh a little shy on time, so I'm going to move straightly, straight to Sophie. Uh, your last number of tips, Sophie. How do I select what competitions to enter and how, and do certain images do better in certain competitions? I think you're going to cover that in uh, your next batch here. Yes, Jim, I'm going to try and talk extremely fast to get through my final sort of three tips. So the 10th tip is to pick the right photo for the right competition. And I think we've already touched on this uh, in the previous discussion. Um, you remember that some competitions, often the larger ones, are judged by a jury that gets together, while other competitions are judged by individuals who work alone. When a jury gets together, the judging is a really dynamic process. Each judge influences the others, sharing their view of an image in a way that's really compelling and convincing. So sometimes they can sway the others to see the image as they do, and other times the rest of the jury may be resolute and, and unmoved. But it's a really exciting creative process, and it's a really good opportunity for more unusual images to make their mark. So what you might call a wild card image with a keen advocate on the jury may go on to win the competition, and it will be a talking point for everyone who visits the exhibition like Nils Blurry Blesbuck. But by comparison, competitions that are judged remotely, they work on a point system. So with this ju judging format, images that impress all the judges, being technically excellent, interesting, creative, and generally pleasing to all, they rise to the top. Now, images that are likely to split the jury, pictures that one may, judge may love, but another one just doesn't feel it, they're less likely to succeed in this sort of jury system. So it may be better to play it safe and enter your most solid, but arguably less surprising shots in these sort of competitions and reserve your images that are more creative or challenging for competitions that are judged by a group jury. 
Now, certain competitions are known to embrace novel views of nature more than others. And Marcel has already mentioned that by studying the winners from past years on their websites, you can start to identify which they are. For example, GDT European Wildlife Photographer of the Year is known for this sort of thing. So I just want to quickly whiz through some quick fire tips that you should also think about when entering. Uh, one, portrait shots are smaller when viewed on a screen than landscape images. So their impact can be diminished in the early stages of judging. Two, consider using your full quota of images. Some, photo some pro photographers always say to do this, like Tom Peshak, he once said to me that it was always the shots he entered only to make up numbers that win the prizes. That said, when you're Tom Peshak, every image, even the last minute ones are pretty damn good. Now don't leave entering to the last minute. Technical glitches always happen when you don't have time to fix them. So try to enter, well, if not early, then at least in good time. Tip 11 is to be careful. Not all competitions are the same. I'm sure you'd rather be out taking photos than sitting at your desk entering competitions. So when you do, make sure you're spending your time wisely. Ask yourself what you want to achieve from entering the competition. Are you interested in your work being seen by thousands of people or knowing where you rank alongside other professional photographers like myself said? Do you want a big crash prize or just to highlight an issue that you care about to a wider audience like Neil? If you can answer this question, then you'll be better able to pick out which competitions will help you achieve your goal. There are so many competitions these days. And while some offer the winners international press coverage, money prizes, maybe flights to an award ceremony, others offer little more than a pat on the back and a free book. If that book will enable your work to be seen by more people, maybe commissioning editors, then this may still work for you. It's up to you, but just be careful to read the rules. Some competitions these days operates what's known as rights grab, which means that by entering, you may be granting the organizer permission to use your images however they wish without any further payment in the future. Imagine seeing a billboard with your image and receiving no credit or fee for its use. These competitions are often run as a way of securing a free library of images for the organizer. And though they may seem more rewarding in the short term, longer term, you may wish you'd never entered. Now, generally speaking, competitions that offer winners the chance to get together with their peers and with other industry, industry professionals and network like mad are the best ones to enter. The most exciting thing about attending the Wildlife Talk of the Year ceremony every year is the chance to see old friends, discover new talent and discuss ways to work together. You also need to check the rules really carefully to see if your competition of choice upholds the standards of ethics that match your own and runs checks on the images. So the Wildlife Talk of the Year competition looks for pictures that are authentic and true to nature. Now this requires a process of ethical checks, which for finalists includes checking raw or original JPEG files. This means it's vital that you don't alter your image beyond what could have traditionally been achieved in a darkroom, as Marcel found. This can be limiting, but at least you know that everyone is held to the same strict standard. Other competitions express, embrace more creative or artistic interpretations and adjustments. And so you need to be confident that your image is able to compete on that basis. So once you've checked all of this out, I normally suggest that you focus your efforts on a handful, maybe fewer than five competitions and make it your goal to understand the rules, how the judging works, study past winners and choose your work that stands the best chance of success. My final words, words of wisdom for tonight are don't be put off. Many of the world's leading photographers enter the world's best nature competitions. But even if you're not a professional yet, don't let that discourage you. Imagination and skill are not limited by professional age. The most creative visual artists can be the youngest. And all images are usually judged without the creator's identities being known. So everyone is judged at the same level. These are my 12 tips for winning competitions. And now there's all that's left for me to do is wish you all the best of luck. Back to you, Shem. Thank you, Sophie. I know from those tips, I will now definitely win the next uh, photo competition. <laughs> that I'm into. Thank you. <laughs> but that concludes the formal side, uh, the discussion side of this evening. So thank you to Sophie, Neil and Marcel but you guys are not off the hook yet because we have a number of uh, questions that have come through, which very fortunately are lumped together. A number of people have asked very similar types of questions. So Sophie, is, a number of people have asked the same type of question here, which is 
how much influence does its storytelling and or the description of the image have on the judge's decisions? And if, if any, at any particular time. And um, there's another one that you can answer almost in the same breath, breath there is a cropping of images. What is the limit to the images that have been cropped and are heavily cropped? And are they measured then against the raw file? If they have been heavily cropped, I'll, I'll leave that to you to answer. Yeah, so two, two, two questions there. Um, cropping, uh, how much cropping is allowed very much depends on the rules for each independent competition. So do check what the competition you want to enter says about that. I know with Wildlife Photography of the Year, you know, obviously as you zoom into an image, uh, it, the, the quality is going to start to deteriorate and they need to be able to exhibit these images pretty big. So they don't allow huge crops. So it's definitely worth, that's a really important thing to be aware of, a good question uh, before you enter your, uh, your image. In terms of uh, captions, that's another really good thing. And I know that I've been on many juries when I've actually said we need to see the captions while we are judging because often they are uh, reserved for later stages, say round two or sometimes just the finals. And for me, knowing the story behind an image can really make a big difference to my emotional response to it and how, how I feel about it, you know, where it should be placed. So often the captions are only available to the judges in, in the later stages once they've been cut down from the multitudes. So your image really does have to be able to stand up by itself uh, without necessarily uh, having that back, essential background information in the early stages. Although one small tip for some competitions is uh, make sure that the name of your image actually describes some of that essential information you want the judges to know because there's always a chance that they will either be able to access that information instantly or see it when they're reviewing the image. So at least they'll get the species right or there might be some essential facts there in that file name. Thank you. Well, there's an, a great number of images coming in saying how much people have appreciated the great information that you guys have given. A lot of thank yous from many, many people. Uh, many of the questions have been technical, which Janet in the background has also been asking. So the last question I'm going to ask, only one more, which is a very uh, practical one, is to Marcel. Because a number of people have asked about your macaque photograph with that cell phone. Uh, what happened to the cell phone? How did it get there? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Can you please just elaborate? What happened? Did you add the cell phone in afterwards is another question. So. The reason it got to where it was, was obviously um, because of the nature of the image. Yeah, so um, that photograph was photographed in Japan. Um, those are snow monkeys. And I've been there like many, many, many times. And usually they're just chilling in the, in the water. That's by the way, another location that over the years has become increase, increasingly popular also because of images posted online to the extent where it got like super crowded uh, with tourists. And uh, this particular image I shot when there was a whole bus of, of, uh, of tourists dropped. And there was one lady with an iPhone and uh, these monkeys are not afraid of people. So they get very close. And this lady wanted to take portraits with her phone. So she just held her phone out and basically got closer and closer to the monkey uh, to the point where the mo monkey probably thought that it was a gift. So the monkey grabbed it from, uh, from her hands and then quickly retreated into the water. And there he was with, uh, with the phone. And uh, that was a moment I instantly recognized as something that had a lot of potential. Uh, but the problem was that the monkey was uh, constantly like, it didn't know it was a phone, obviously. So it was just using it as, a, as, a, as an object. So it was dunking it in the water and holding it upside down, actually managed to pop the flash uh, a couple of times. And uh, meanwhile, the tourist was like shouting and screaming to, to get her phone back, uh, which obviously I very much enjoyed. And then there was this one moment where the monkey just held the phone uh, the way that a human would also hold the phone. And that's the only uh, photograph, or maybe I have one other one that, that I really liked in all the other ones, it was uh, it was not uh, not so good. But to give you an example of what I men mentioned earlier, the effect that a photograph can have on uh, on a species is that later I heard that uh, after this image won, um, 
people actually brought secondhand phones to this uh, place and then started handing out the phones <laughs> to the monkeys in an effort to replicate that shot. So I, again, there's another example of uh, how things just get totally messed up by, uh, by one single image. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we've had a couple of last, well, not last minute uh, questions, but a few more questions come through. So we'll, I think we'll fi finish off with Neil with two specific questions. Um, the person asking about the, the quality of the camera and cropping there. Uh, and then also uh, the full name of the contest, your blurry best buck, which is now, you, that's a generic term for it. <laughs> <Fine. laughs> chat calls, which has been asked. If you could give us the name of that, thanks. Of course. So um, yeah, the, the competition is called the GDT European Wildlife Photography of the Year. So GDT, I'm not going to try and pronounce that name. Maybe it's a trap. Someone asked you that question. I don't know. But, um, but yeah, uh, GDT is a German uh, photography uh, club society. Uh, they run the European Wildlife Photography of the Year competition. So uh, that will help you out to find it. Um, I really wanted to, to, to answer uh, Finley's question there about uh, starting out and having, um, having a camera that you know, may not be seen as a decent quality. But to be honest, it's one of those things that you know so many people seem to worry about. But honestly, go back and look at the look at the book of wildlife photography for the year, and go and look at some of the uh, some of the, the most successful images. So the winning picture, what is it? three, four years ago now, um, of the orangutan climbing the tree was taken on a GoPro. Uh, it's it's, um, it's, it's unbelievable now that, uh, that, that, we, can, uh, that we can have these, these tiny cameras, these action cameras, you know, winning major competitions. And Charlie Hamilton James as well, having a, uh, a camera, I think it was the, one of his vulture images as well, uh, taken on, a, a, again, a very, um, sort of, lower quality, lower end uh, camera, but inexpensive. But a lot of the time actually for camera trapping and for other, um, uh, for, for, for other sort of uses in the field in terms of remote photography, people are using lower quality cameras uh, because also if they get trampled by an elephant, it doesn't matter if they get stolen, it you know, maybe the, 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 the less, uh, there's less loss there financially. Uh, so don't worry too much about the number of pixels. Don't worry too much about whether it has all of the bells and whistles and can't, it's, it's more about the image. It's more about the emotion. It's more about the moment that you've captured. Uh, really, you know, do, do try and think one of the, the, the key message, hopefully you're getting here from, from Marcel and myself is how much planning we put into our, into our images. Uh, and that's far more important than any, um, uh, you know, th than any, uh, camera make or model. Um, that's that's really not taken into account, and um, yeah. So hopefully that 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 covers that that question. Um, and as well, I just want to touch on quickly the cropping um, answer, you know, as well. And I'm seeing it now with with as as image uh, as cameras and, and and the size of images is getting bigger and bigger, more and more uh, megapixels. You're starting to see every year competitions are starting to amend their rules there as well. So it used to be done on a percentage and a lot of competitions will say a maximum of maybe 30% or 50%. But some competitions now are saying, look, we, we don't really care how much you crop as long as there's still maybe 3000 megapixels on the longest side for us to use as a double page spread in a book or in a competition. So um, that's it's, it's worth looking at every competition rule uh, individually um, and every competition every year. Don't think you know the rules because you entered last year. Have a look at them again. Uh, they may have changed and, and they're having to adapt because the technology is ad adapting all the time. I hope that helps. Yeah, thank you very much, Neil. So that concludes this evening. And uh, I just want to once more say thank you to Marcel, Neil and Sophie for your wonderful input, your generous uh, giving of knowledge because this is not the type of information that we hear every day. It literally isn't. It's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful melting pot of information that we've had this evening. We've seen some very, very nice responses from all the people involved. So thank you for all of you that have tuned in for this evening. Uh, and I wish everybody well. Everybody, please be safe. And we'll see you again on another Atelier Talk in the near future. Thank you and good night. All right. Thanks, Shem.